Welcome to SGA's Natural Gas Take Action Month's webinar, You Are Equipped, Now Become a Natural Gas Champion. As a reminder, all attendees have been muted upon arrival today to reduce any background noise, and attendees do not have the ability to share video. To submit questions or comments throughout the session, please use the questions field in your webinar control panel. If you lose connection or accidentally close out of today's webinar, you can always rejoin using the GoToWebinar link sent with your confirmation. Today's materials are also available in the handout section of your webinar screen. Now we have presented before you our standard SGA disclaimers. It is also a part of our process with all events to share with you our antitrust reminder. The purpose of federal and state antitrust statutes is to assure the preservation of a free and competitive economy. To achieve this end, these laws embody a general prohibition against any agreement or combination among competitors, which has the effect of unreasonably restraining trade. It is the policy of SGA to conduct its activities in strict compliance with all applicable federal and state antitrust laws and to avoid the appearance of impropriety. Now at this time, it is our pleasure to welcome Bill Cantrell, Executive Liaison with Southern Gas Association. Bill? Thank you, Stephanie, and good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I'm really honored to participate in this very special month of learning and development. Our SGA chair, Don Rakes, has had a very dynamic and compelling theme this year, centering around three elements of natural gas. I hope you've had a chance to hear presentations and receive training on how natural gas is reliable, essential, and innovative. And I hope you've come away from these opportunities energized and enthusiastic. In fact, I hope you've come away ready to become a natural gas champion. This one hour webinar is a condensed version of the four hour workshop SGA developed over two years ago and is now delivered to over 1,000 employees from over 100 companies. We've recently updated some of the content so even if you've taken the four hour workshop in the past, you're gonna see some new materials and some new concepts. So here's a little background. The Natural Gas Champions Initiative was developed because the industry was facing hurricane force headwinds from individuals, from the media, and from organizations that were opposed to our product and our industry. Now, in some cases, these groups didn't have the facts. But in many cases, they didn't want to be bothered by the fact. We seem to be living in a world that favors rhetoric over reality. A world where there's an awful lot of sentiment towards eliminating the very product we provide. You know these groups, they're very well funded and they have catchy slogans like no fracking and keep it in the ground. They have large groups of followers and they use social media to their advantage. They can generate large crowds to delay or stop your projects at the drop of a hat. They've taken advantage of these platforms to speak up and be heard. On the other hand, our industry hasn't been speaking up enough. I think we got used to the arrows being directed at coal or the electric side of the energy industry and we kind of stayed below the radar screen. We've had plenty of good messages like the ones you see here, but we've just simply too often chosen to stay in the background. I mean, after all, we were the good fossil fuel, right? That is, we were the good fossil fuel until we weren't the good fossil fuel. And now we're behind the eight ball in our communications. We have to speak up. Thousands of us, maybe tens of thousands of us need to be educated, trained, and willing to talk with family, friends, and neighbors. This is so critically important. Look at the sentence on this page. Read it to yourself for a minute. Do you think the public understands natural gas? Do you think they'll support us? <clears throat> I actually do, if we're prepared properly. I'm firmly convinced this approach will work and we can reclaim the narrative. 
you may ask, well, why? Why are you so confident? Well, for one thing, we have the facts on our side. You know that, and we're gonna go over a lot of those today. I've tried this approach out and I've been successful at it. And in addition, natural gas champions, this whole effort is based on two premises. The first is that more than 50% of the population is persuadable on energy issues. There are a lot of surveys and evidence that show that this is the case. And the second premise is that our own employees are the most trusted messengers on energy issues. A speaker I heard a couple years ago said it this way, the public trusts our employees that wear the blue shirts with their names stitched on the pockets. And why wouldn't they? Our employees live in the communities we serve. They raise their children there. They're trusted to be in people's backyards reading a meter or inside the house lighting a pilot or installing a natural gas appliance. This all supports the need for a grassroots effort. Now, I want to tell you a story about grassroots efforts. It, it might actually be a story about the failure of not having a grassroots effort. And I want to share this story to illustrate why grassroots efforts are so powerful why we need to use grassroots efforts to get the facts out to the public. Now, this is a true story. It's about me. I live in a residential neighborhood with narrow streets and lots of oak trees. I grew up in the area, as did most of my neighbors. In fact, most of the houses were on my paper route when I was a teenager growing up. I love this area. We found out by accident that there was a project to install a huge stormwater runoff line down our street. We discovered that it was planned to be 17 feet wide, concrete, and our 17 foot wide street would be completely dug up to install it. We had not been informed about the project and we naturally assumed the worst. Our property values would go down, our oak trees would be lost, and we wouldn't have decent access to our property during the construction period. And we didn't even know how long the construction period was. So we got together with our neighbors. We retained a lawyer. We found a person with some street planning experience. We sent letters. We called elected officials and got the newspapers to come by and do a story about our trees and the children who love them. I mean, it's kind of cheesy, right? We had our children out there drawing pictures of, of oak trees. And, uh, and had the paper have a photographer out there. You know, we spent some money, we lost a lot of sleep, but you know what? We ultimately won. That project was abandoned. Does it sound familiar on the flip side of what people sometimes do with our projects? And is it because we haven't talked to them? So here are the two points I wanted to make about my little personal story here. Information and communications is critical. Our neighborhood had no advance notice. We knew nothing about the timing, the construction project process, any studies on the impact on trees, reclamation of the street land. If we had been informed at all about this project, many of our fears might have been mitigated and we probably would not have had as big or powerful a voice. And, and here's the, the second main point. We can't forget this, citizens groups and grassroots efforts are powerful. Our group actually developed kind of an esprit de corps about our activity. We had fun, we got to know each other a little better. We formed some powerful bonds. We could not be ignored. So my message here is companies have to get information out early. And one of the best ways to do that is through their employees. All of us, you and me, and all of our colleagues, and that's what Natural Gas Champions is all about. Now, the Natural Gas Champions workshop is divided into three modules, and you see them listed here. In the time we have today, I'm going to blend some elements of the first two modules and demonstrate how to turn good messages into great messages. We'll spend about 15 minutes on that. Then I'll cover quite a bit, most of module three, because that's on communicating effectively. And we'll have an exercise where I'll help you create your very own elevator speech. And we'll talk a lot about elevator speeches in a few minutes. So 
The first thing we need to do as champions is to remember to be proud of our companies and our industry. We need to be able to identify the many benefits that natural gas provides. Natural gas is domestic and abundant. Our industry provides about 10 million well-paying jobs within the U.S. We add $1.3 trillion to the U.S. economy, and we account for 7.6% of the gross domestic product of the U.S. Natural gas is comfortable and convenient. It dries clothes faster, it heats water faster, it cooks food better, and it's available when the power is out due to storms or other outages. That leads into the fact that natural gas is safe and reliable. On average, there's been a 10% decline in pipeline incidences every three years. What a great record. Natural gas is affordable and efficient. A family will save an average of $847 a year compared to electricity. I'll have a little bit more detail about that when we get into the messaging. Now, most of, the, most of us know these benefits very well, but the general public doesn't. The public continues to have concerns with natural gas. So when we began the Natural Gas Champions Initiative, we held focus groups in four different locations, Dallas, Tulsa, Washington, D.C., and Columbus, Ohio. We reviewed the benefits of natural gas you just saw, and then we asked people what they thought were the major concerns the public and other groups had. As you might imagine, we received a, a lot of input. But as we started looking at that, we found we could group all of those concerns into the four areas that I've listed here. As I mentioned, we can't spend three hours uh, on these four which basically is the second of the modules I usually cover. So what I'm gonna do is summarize some of the biggest concerns out of those focus groups and suggest some great messages to address those concerns, messages we can use in our communications. Here's a list of those concerns we'll go over. I picked out five of them. Safety was mentioned as a concern with regard to hydraulic fracturing and in really all areas of pipeline operations. Carbon emissions, the major concern most people have, and it figured prominently in both hydraulic fracturing and climate change. Domestic abundance, this is a really interesting concern. I'll explain how what we see as a benefit is actually a big concern to our detractors. Efficiency, which usually has a very positive connotation, but but which people don't really understand, particularly about natural gas efficiency and how it can help lead us to a sustainable future. And finally, I'll cover renewables. Renewables seems to be on everyone's minds and is suggested as an answer to every concern that's out there. So again, I'm gonna dive into these five areas a little bit. And I really have two goals in mind. One is to how to turn good messages into great messages and how to make the communications that we have with our family, friends, and neighbors visual, relatable, and memorable. And all of this then will be used in, when we create our elevator speeches. Okay, so let's explore safety first. You know, we're very proud of our emphasis and our results in safety, and justifiably so. Let me start by asking you a question. How do you talk about natural gas safety? Take a few seconds and think about it. What would you say if you're talking to a neighbor and you wanted to talk about how safe natural gas was? Do you talk about your company's safety record? Do you compare your safety uh, statistics to other companies in the industry? Do you brag about the safety awards you've received? Do you quote statistics like the DART rate? Don't get me wrong, these are good statistics. I've used them plenty of times for incentive compensation, for reports to boards of directors, and to state regulatory commissions. I currently serve as an independent board member for a services company. 
And this kind of data was presented just a couple of weeks ago at our quarterly board meeting. It's perfect for measuring how you are doing internally and what improvements are being made. But how does that data come across to the average person that is concerned with safety? Or more importantly, how does it come across to an opponent of your pipeline project that wants to find any way possible to slow down or stop your project? Would this day, data be very helpful if an opponent uses scare tactics and tells people that natural gas is not safe and that your project will surely lead to explosions? I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it would, probably not. But what if you showed a comparison between the safety of pipelines with other forms of transportation? Look at these five pie charts which shows relative safety data among five forms of transportation. There's data here regarding fatalities in a recent year for highways, railroads, maritime, aviation, and finally, pipelines. Now the data is a bit more relatable to the average person. You can see this data pretty clearly, and you can use something like this to show that pipelines are more than an order of magnitude safer than other forms of transportation. These are some pretty impressive statistics, aren't they? And they come from the US Department of Transportation. Uh, they're third party numbers, they're not my numbers. But even so, you know, five pie charts, there's a lot of figures there, it might be a little hard to read. Let's take it one step further. Let's just compare two things. Let's put the form of transportation most familiar to citizens on a similar footing as pipelines. Everyone spends time in cars, right? We're on our nation's paved roads every day. People can relate to highway safety. So these two maps, I'm sorry, I'm getting a message that my uh, internet connectivity is a little uncertain. If I get that message again, I may have to uh, take my webcam off. Uh, if so, don't worry about it, you'll hear me and the slides will become full screen. Hopefully we won't do that. Uh, so these two maps show highway and pipeline infrastructure covering our country and summarize the safety records of each. Both sets of infrastructure serve critical needs of our entire population. They both function 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Now, we always wanna point out that we strive for zero incidents. And of course, zero fatalities, and that any fatality is one too many. But gosh, the difference between eight fatalities a year for pipelines versus over 36,000 on our highways is remarkable. This is really a great message. And now it's not just relatable to the public. The map adds a visual element, and the comparison is something pretty easy to remember. This is a great way to communicate about natural gas safety. Now, let's transition to the second subject. How clean a fuel natural gas is, particularly its carbon profile. Natural gas is mostly methane, CH4. And we're used to talking about how simple a mo molecule it is and how clean it is. So let me ask you the same question I did on safety. How do you describe this to others? Or do you? Are you reluctant to engage in a conversation because natural gas is a fossil fuel? If you do engage, do you tell the other person apologetically that although natural gas is a fossil fuel, it's cleaner than the others? Do you stay in your technical persona, like me, uh, as an engineer and proudly demonstrate the lower emission rates of natural gas versus other fossil fuels, like in this chart? These are very valid calculations and they're good numbers to prove our points. I use this same exact chart when I teach natural gas champions. But I think we instinctively know that this good data might not really be very persuasive. Most people are gonna say, well, you know, natural gas is still a fossil fuel. It still emits carbon dioxide and burns. And burn, it's simply the best of several bad choices. Wow. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the best of a number of bad choices. We have to find a way to make this message resonate with people. 
we have to show what people why the clean nature of natural gas really does matter. This chart is the way to do that. Natural gas has lower carbon emissions than coal, and natural gas is steadily replacing coal as a power plant fuel. You can see that in the chart. This is a little bit busy, but let me just point out a couple things. Coal used for electric generation is shown in orange, and you can see it's been decreasing for quite a few years. Natural gas used for electric generation is red, and it's been increasing by about the same amount as coal is decreasing. So even though natural gas usage is increasing, carbon emissions are going down as shown in the line on this graph. Now, this is a lot of data, but it's visual and it needs only a couple points to be made. Number one, carbon emissions are declining in the US due to increased use of natural gas. Two, this decline will continue for decades as natural gas continues to replace coal. And you know, if you really want to make it memorable, add another fact, a statement by a United Nations official, the US is on track to meet the goals of the Paris Climate Accords. That's a pretty strong statement. So again, turning a good message into a great message. Okay, now I told you this was gonna be an interesting one when we talk about domestic abundance. We know that hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling have opened up significant new reserves of natural gas and oil at affordable prices. In fact, the data compiled by the Potential Gas Committee indicates that we have more than a 100 year supply of natural gas. I'm tickled about that. I'm glad we're all, I think we're probably all glad of that fact. And it's a good message to share. But here's the quirk. This data points actually a negative with much of the environmental community. I mean, think about it. Can't you just hear them saying, 100 years, oh my God, we'll never get rid of natural gas. So here again, the data is good news for us, but it doesn't really help us communicate or persuade those people that just frankly want to eliminate natural gas. In fact, I would argue that it might stiffen their resolve against us. So here's a better way to talk about the abundance of natural gas. Don't just talk about how much natural gas we have in the US. Cite the fact that as we've just discussed previously, carbon emissions are declining in the US because of the abundance of natural gas. And then add a message regarding how we've become a net, a net exporter of natural gas. Think about this. Climate change is viewed as a global situation. So we're reinforcing that the US natural gas industry is helping lower carbon emissions in other countries as well as in the US. So this type graph adds a visual element and it now becomes a great message about abundance. However, it's still a lot of data, very much data driven. So I'm gonna take it one step further. The greatest message maybe. Let's talk about how our abundance in the US helps reduce energy poverty in other countries. Did you know there are over 1 billion people living in energy poverty around the world? That means these people don't have access to affordable, efficient energy for cooking, heating, cleaning clothes, and so forth. Affordable natural gas doesn't just replace coal and power plants. It replaces wood and even animal dung as the fuel for cooking and heating in much of the world. Therefore, it improves air quality and improves quality of life, even as it lowers carbon emissions. People can visualize cooking over an open fire. They can kind of see the smoke and the smell. It's a memorable message. This is now truly great communications. Okay, moving to the fourth area. <clears throat> we often talk about how efficient the direct use of natural gas is. The chart you see here is courtesy of the American Gas Association playbook. They update this every year. It's very good data. The top swim lane shows the efficiency of the direct use of natural gas. The bottom swim lane shows the efficiency of electricity. Although there are small losses 
you can see in the transmission and distribution of both energy sources, there are pretty significant losses in the power plant step for electric generation. The resulting numbers, as you see on the right pane of each swim line, is that direct use of natural gas is 91% efficient. And that's compared to 36% for electricity. Again, a good message. I use this chart frequently. But frankly, it's a bit technical for the average person not in our industry, and it's not really very personal. Let's, think, let's face it, most people flip a switch in their home, the electricity is there, it's quiet, it's instantaneous, there are no indoor emissions, it's very reliable too. You know, what's the problem? Why should I worry about this? Well, in order to make this a great message, we need to show the results of this amazing efficiency of natural gas and make the message relatable. A great way to make things personal to people is put it into dollars and cents. So let's look at this graph. We can show the result on the national economy as this chart does. You can see the increased use of natural gas and the decline in carbon emissions. Now, again, these are kind of the same lines we saw on that other chart of electric generation. But now this chart adds in an economic factor. Gross domestic product has also been increasing as the use of natural gas increases. And that should be obvious, right? An increase in affordable, efficient energy has to improve financial results, whether it's for your country or for your business. So we have a great message on the national scale. But let's, again, take it a step further and make it even more relatable. Let's get this message directly to the average person's wallet. This chart shows that homes using natural gas experience lower total energy bills by a significant amount. Everyone can relate to saving money on energy bills, and the large amount of savings make the, makes this quite a memorable message. This shows a real example of how natural gas efficiency makes a big difference, and it becomes a great message. All right, we're going to move to the last of the five areas of communications. You know, the word that probably best represents the answer to climate change in most people's minds is renewables. You hear it all the time. Although biomass and hydroelectric power have traditionally, and I think still are, the most significant sources of renewable electric generation, most of the news we hear these days concerns wind and solar power. The natural gas industry has used a very good message in this area. Since wind and solar are intermittent sources and natural gas power generation is the logical and best source to supplement wind and solar, we've talked about how natural gas is a critical partner in making wind and solar successful. It's, it's pretty easy to show it in a picture like you see here. The top line represents the electric load required by customers on a peak winter day. Okay, so this goes from midnight to midnight. You can see that the peak electric requirement is at around seven in the morning when people turn up the heat, take hot showers, cook breakfast, commercial buildings are cranking up the heat to prepare for the day's needs. The yellow part of this chart represents what solar generation can do to serve those needs. Now, it's a pretty good message to point out that the winter peak occurs when the sun is just rising. So solar generation can't really contribute to the peak winter demand. In fact, all of the green area is electric demand that a solar plant won't be able to serve. Hence the need for natural gas fueled power plants. Now I have to ask you, how effective is this good message gonna be in the long run? If battery technology continues to improve in efficiency and cost, will natural gas be relegated once again to being considered a bridge fuel? And is this a bridge to nowhere? There's nothing wrong with continuing to use this good message about partnering with renewable electric generation. But we have a better message, a truly great message that hasn't been communicated nearly enough. And that's about renewable natural gas. We have the remarkable opportunity to talk about negative carbon emissions. 
whether it comes from landfills, from water treatment plants, or from animal waste. Our industry has the ability to take methane that would have been released to the environment, convert it to pipeline quality gas, and have it utilized as a fuel in appliances or in power plants. Now, there's going to be carbon emissions that result from the end use of this renewable natural gas, but we'll also be reducing emissions of methane, which is about 30 times as potent a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide. Hence the opportunity for net negative emissions. Talking about negative emissions is memorable, and it results in a great, great message. Okay, so we've reviewed the benefits of natural gas. We've created some great messages to counter some of the concerns that people have. Now we need to explore how we package all this great information to begin changing the narrative about natural gas. Your company probably has an ESG plan. And your website probably already has excellent messaging about what your company is doing. But remember the example I gave you about the stormwater line down my street and my stressing the value of person-to-person -person communications? I'd argue that your ESG plan and your website are important, but they're not the whole picture. They're not enough. We need thousands of industry employees talking with family, friends, and neighbors about natural gas. Often, we only have 20 to 30 seconds to make our points. Are you ready to make the most of those 20 to 30 seconds? The last part of our hour will help you do that. We're gonna work on creating elevator speeches, so named because you might have 20 to 30 seconds in an elevator with the person that you want to persuade. A good way to begin creating an elevator speech is to focus on what your company does in the local community. It's an easy way to break the ice in a conversation. You're probably going to be talking about someone who lives in the same area that you do. We've thrown some ideas up in the branches of this tree. So, for example, if the person you're talking to works in economic development, talk about the jobs your company creates or how much your company pays in local taxes. If the person you're talking to has kids in Little League Baseball, mention the ballpark sign that your company sponsors. If the person serves on charitable boards, talk about the amount your company gives to United Way. And then, of course, it's always helpful to mention safety. But the point of this is, is to think of things that break the ice, to be non-controversial. And, and, and you need to remember this as well, because you always want to be positive and proud of who you work for. So keep things in mind. And now here are some important tips to remember. Gosh, I wish we were person to person because it's I, I love to do this and, and demonstrate some of the things to do and not to do, but I'll do my best here. Here are seven tips. First of all, be aware of your body language. Don't cross your arms. Don't shake your head as if disagreeing. Don't frown. Don't pound your fist. Be positive. Smile. Open your hands and palms. Look the other person directly in the eye. Second tip, listen to what the other person has to say. You know, they'll usually tell you exactly what their concern is. You don't need to guess at it. And it may not all be negative. What if a person begins a sentence by saying, I don't like natural gas, and you jump right in with 14 facts about the benefits? But what if the end of their statement was going to be, but I know it's the best energy choice right now. Wow, you missed it. And you missed an opportunity to find some common ground, which is so important. The third tip is to keep it simple. Don't memorize too many facts. Don't commit to memory the CO2 emission rates of gas versus coal. I mean, commit it if you want to, but don't necessarily use it in an elevator speech. That's more than likely way more detail than you'll have time for. It's far better to develop two or three simple statements. Here's a, here's a sample. Did you know that CO2 emissions in this country are decreasing and it's because of the increased use of natural gas? Pretty, pretty impressive and it's very simple. Fourth tip, it's okay to say you don't know. No one knows all the facts. In fact, if, if you're waiting to have an elevator speech with someone until you know all the facts, <laughs> it's not going to happen. 
Uh, none of us will ever know all the facts. So if you're talking to someone and they say, you know, when utility ABC put that pipeline in last year, everybody's property values went down 20%. Well, you might not believe that, but if you don't have any knowledge or facts about it, you can't claim otherwise. It's best to acknowledge that you don't know the answer to that question, but offer to get some facts back to them. And you know what? It opens up the opportunity for another chat. The fifth one, sometimes you have to agree to disagree. Another person may claim facts you know to be untrue or misleading at least. It doesn't help to call them a liar or even that they don't know what they're talking about. You can agree to disagree though for that conversation on that topic. And again, like before, it gives you the opportunity to look up some facts or a study and set up another discussion. Six, open yourself up to conversations. Ask open-ended questions sometime during your elevator speech, like what concerns do you have about water quality? Or I'd like to hear more about your views. Others will open up with you. And you know what? They're gonna feel complimented that you want their opinion. Don't make it one-sided. And finally, don't fight. Share your views. Arguments and name calling won't get you where you need to go. You need to listen and empathize with the other party. Now, I'm not saying you should back away. Share your views, but figure out a way to do it in a positive manner. So you want your elevator speech to be memorable, impactful, and effective. These are kind of similar to the goals I used for messaging, which were memorable, relatable, and visual. And, and the next slide, show some tips for doing that. And I'll give you one example. A memorable elevator speech is built on the basis of a strong case. It's based on logical arguments with facts or evidence to back it up. Look at the items on this track and let's use the example of natural gas use helping lower carbon emissions. Does an elevator speech built around that fact meet these three criteria? I think it does. First, it's very logical to assume that if you substitute a low carbon fuel for a high carbon fuel, there will be a reduction, right? And you can state this logical information, this logical argument in one sentence. So it's very simple. And finally, evidence. Evidence consists of facts that come from an independent third party. In this case, the Energy Information Administration. This actually makes it a much stronger case than if the data came from an industry group. To be impactful, an elevator speech should contain creative elements. If you can, try to incorporate any of the five senses. Instead of saying, we serve 300,000 customers, say, we provide energy for hot showers, cozy fireplaces, fuzzy towels, delicious dinners, etc. Make it visual to the other person. The best way to do this is to make, make it come from your heart. Create your message, it's what you believe in. This is not a canned set of talking points. So here are the steps for creating a good elevator speech. There's six steps here. First of all, identify the main point you want to convey. You can't cover all the stuff that we covered today, but do you want to talk mainly about safety? Is it about CO2 emissions? Is it about how natural gas supports renewables? This may depend on what your background is, what you're most passionate about, that will make the best elevator speech. So pick out one of those areas. Figure out how you want to explain the main point. Do you want to use statistics, a chart? Do you want to tell a story? Do you want to quote from a reliable source? Third, state your unique selling proposition. What does this mean? It, it gives the other person an idea of why you have this opinion and what your credentials are. Why should they trust what you're saying? The fourth step is then assemble the elements of your speech. Put them in a logical order and make sure you don't have too much for 20 to 30 seconds. That's sometimes harder to do than it sounds like. The fifth step, engage with someone you trust and are comfortable with. See if it makes sense to them and ask them to be honest with you and suggest ways to improve it. You could use your spouse or a coworker or even a even a, a grown child. 
And then finally, practice your speech. Now, I don't necessarily mean to memorize it word for word. That may come off as too scripted, but say it out loud. Remember, most of us talk differently than we write. In fact, say it in front of a mirror if you're self-conscious. It needs to be succinct, but relaxed. And again, it needs to be your voice and your words. Okay, now we're gonna move into an exercise where I'm gonna ask every single one of you participating to create your very own elevator speech. I've outlined the process for you, but I'm gonna do one more thing before I turn you loose to do that. And that's provide a couple examples. Now, the first one might seem a little bit silly, but it gives you some things not to do. So here it is, ready? <clears throat> Hi, I'm John Smith and I work for ABC Gas Company, so I know what I'm talking about. You should sign up for our natural gas because it's better than electricity and it's cheaper too. Don't believe all that stuff you hear about climate change. Gas is good and we got plenty of it. <laughs> so there's lots of things wrong with that, isn't there? Uh, the speaker's pretty arrogant, doesn't express interest in your opinion, doesn't invite questions, and makes conclusions without any evidence. So don't be John. Here's a better one. Good morning. I'm Mike Davies, and I work for ABC Gas Company. Thanks for chatting with me about my company and the concerns you have about natural gas and climate change. Let me share a few facts that I think will surprise you. Did you know that the increased use of natural gas over the last 10 years has actually helped reduce carbon emissions in the US? And that trend is expected to continue. I hope that answers some of your questions about our future in natural gas. I'd love to hear any other thoughts you have and spend some time reviewing them. Okay, so that one states who you are, establishes, establishes your credentials, you work for a gas company. It, it states some facts, some evidence, it asks an open-ended question. Um, it invites a conversation and some follow-up. So again, it is, I've got 1242 Central Time uh, right now. Let's take uh, about seven minutes, work on your speech by yourself, of course, and submit it to me via the question field in your control box. And if you're willing to share it with all the participants, let us know and we can unmute you when the exercise is over and you can say it yourself. Otherwise, if you're willing to let me share it, I'll be happy to share it. So again, let's take seven minutes right now. We'll, we'll get back on at 12.50. Thanks everyone. Uh, are finished or are satisfied with it, uh, but I'm gonna use some of this time to answer questions. Otherwise, uh, we'll run out of time and I won't have a chance to answer all of them. This is an excellent question and it's a difficult one. So here's the question that I got. We live in coal country. How do you change your elevator speech when you know you may be talking to a coal miner, family member, or former coal miner? Again, that's a great question. First of all, let me tell you a little bit about my background and why I'm sensitive, particularly sensitive to this. I worked for Tico Energy for almost 35 years. And I worked on the electric side for about 22 of those years. <clears throat> and uh, at one point, I was the director of fuels and responsible for buying about 7 million tons of coal a year. Um, I, I think coal is a great fuel for electric generation, and I believe it can be burned very cleanly. But the simple fact is that uh, coal is being phased out, not simply because of um, carbon emissions, but because of economics. We've, we've found so much natural gas at such great prices. So in the four hour course, uh, gosh, I, I feel like I'm making another speech here. I'm sorry about that, but I'm pretty passionate about this. In the four hour course I teach, I emphasize, and maybe I should have done it today, nothing that we say should be anti-electric, anti-coal, or certainly anti-environment. We don't need to make political statements with our speeches. This should be pro-natural gas. Now, in the statistics, I talk about how natural gas is replacing coal, but I think we can emphasize that coal is gonna be around for a couple more decades. Uh, we're not just shutting down the, all the coal plants. Uh, coal plants are getting cleaner all the time as well. 
we're going to continue to rely on coal for a substantial amount of our electric generation for a couple more decades. But as those plants retire or as they are repowered to use natural gas, it helps our country's total um, carbon emissions. So I think, I think the key is to be sensitive about it and not talk down coal, talk about how natural gas is working with coal. It's there to support renewables as, as well as to, to help repower uh, former coal plants. Um, we've got to face the facts as we do when we talk about hydraulic fracturing uh, and, and everything else that there are some consequences we can't do anything about um, and we have to be sensitive to those. All right, I'm starting to get a couple in. Let me, let me, uh, well, keep, I tell you what, keep sending them to, to me, and I am going to begin uh, reading a couple of these, and so you can, uh, you can listen to some. Okay, I, I won't, some people may not want me to say their name, so I won't say the name. Hi, I'm uh, the person that submitted this. I work as an economic developer for Spire, a natural gas utility. Um, most of us are aware natural gas is used for heating homes and businesses. It's responsible for hot showers, delicious meals, and cozy nights by the fire. What you may not realize is natural gas is the safest energy delivery system in the country. It provides an energy source that is produced domestically. Sorry, I'm having to scroll my box here. Um, and helps lower carbon emissions. I'm proud to work in an industry that provides 9.8 million jobs in the US, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, now, so what I'm gonna do when I read a couple of these are, are give, provide a little feedback or some thoughts on each. So first of all, this person identifies themselves and establishes their credentials by who they work for. They work for a natural gas utility. They, they mentioned several of the benefits of natural gas in terms of safety and low carbon, they appeal to the senses when they talk about hot showers, delicious meals, and so forth. They talk about how many jobs we produce, and they ask an open-ended question. Uh, so I, I really think that was perfect. And it's about the right length of time. It, I, I didn't time it, but it's about 20 to 30 seconds. So thank you for submitting that one. Let me read the next one. Um, I, I won't read the last name, but I'll make it a little personal. My name is Dillard, and I work for uh, GUC in the Natural Gas Department. Did you know that natural gas is actively reducing carbon emissions? I would love to speak with you about the many benefits that natural gas has to offer. As you know, living in Florida, our power can easily go out for days anytime from June 1st to November 30th during hurricane season. Have you dealt with cold showers, no fan circulation, or spoiled food in the fridge? Sorry, I'm scrolling again. Um, well, all of our customers didn't lose any of these things. Our natural gas lines were completely interrupted. Okay, I think that's the end of that one. That was great. Um, so again, uh, the person identified themselves um, and uh, talked about some of the benefits. In, in fact, it sounds like that person works in Florida and Florida of course is affected, uh, not this year as much as Louisiana, but is affected by hurricanes and um, something that would appeal. Remember when I talked to the branches, the tree, if you're talking to someone in economic development or if you're talking to someone um, you know, that, 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 uh, that works in a particular area, appeal to what they're more in, most interested in, this one does that perfectly. Uh, I live in Florida. I'm in Tampa, Florida right now. I've lost power a lot of times from hurricanes and it's awful nice to have that natural gas backing me up. So again, I'm gonna try to, I'm, I probably can't spend quite as much time on each one of these, but I'm going to try to hit several of them. Um, okay, let me move down to another one. Okay, now I, I actually think that's the only ones, other ones that I've, I've had submitted. And I apologize, but if it looks like I'm looking away from the webcam, I am. I'm, I'm looking at the uh, the question panel here. 
And Bill, this is Stephanie. Um, we have sent over a couple of more and um, you did keep your webcam off for this segment just to let you know. And to oh. also clarify the one that came in from Dylan, um, that one ended with the statement, I would love to speak with you about the many benefits that natural gas has to offer. And the Florida one is another submission that came in from someone else. So they, they looked as if they were one, but they were actually two. Okay. They did run together. I see that now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Okay, here's another one. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for reaching out to ask about my line of work. I work for a civil engineering consulting firm, specifically on designing natural gas improvements, and I'm still making sustainable contributions to the environment and communities around me. Natural gas is actually the cleanest burning fossil fuel. This resource has been improving the environment by reducing the air pollution due to its increasing economic and environmental benefits. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Again, great. Um, you establish the credentials, you, you're a, you work for a civil engineering firm and then you're specifically designing, it's always great to talk about natural gas improvements. <clears throat> uh, mention the fact that natural gas is making contributions to the environment and the communities. Um, it's the cleanest burning fossil fuel, so you mentioned several of the benefits. So again, that's a great one. Let me continue scrolling. Okay, I see one more here. Okay, here's a person that works for Southern Company uh, Gas. Natural gas is one of the most reliable sources of energy. It's used for hot showers, cooking, and heating homes. Most importantly, the increased use of natural gas helps reduce CO2. Uh, I'd like to discuss more how natural gas is not only a reliable source of energy, but also helps reduce carbon. And again, that's great. Okay, we are, I don't see any more right now. Uh, so I'm gonna turn my webcam back on and I think you all will see from all these examples we've talked about how every one of them is very different. Almost every one, I think, used the steps that we talked about. 20 to 30 seconds, you establish your credentials by talking about who you are, uh, ask them open-ended questions, list some of the benefits of natural gas, and um, let me also mention that if anyone would like to submit them after this and get some thoughts from me, or if you have other questions about the material we've covered uh, over the last hour, please send them to me. Um, I, I'd be happy to, uh, to, to respond to those. So let's move on to the, to the last slide uh, in terms of key takeaways uh, as we begin to wrap up here. Remember these things, natural gas benefits your community in many ways. Remember about jobs, lower energy prices, and so forth. When you encounter criticism of the industry, open yourself up to conversations, share your respect, perspectives. Be proud of where you work and don't let others talk it down. An elevator speech should be memorable, impactful, and effective. Solid persuasive cases contain evidence, simple statements and logical arguments. Remember that triangle we looked at. Incorporate creativity with imaginative talking points. Every person's elevator speech is different and that uniqueness is really valuable. Try to incorporate authenticity, genuineness, and honesty to make your argument believable. That's all about coming from the heart. If it's what you feel and what you want to say, that makes it a very effective elevator speech. And finally, have confidence in yourself. You are the most trusted and reliable source of information. Now, we've only got a couple of minutes here, but I want to give everyone a final opportunity for questions. Uh, so if there are any, please send them. And in case we run out of time, let me go ahead and thank everyone for participating in this whole month of, of training and education. And particularly for my benefit, thank you for being on this uh, webinar today. I appreciate your interest. I appreciate the questions you had, the uh, elevator speeches you volunteered. And again, if there are any other questions, I will be happy to answer them.
I am not seeing any, so uh, I, I might ask my colleagues, are there any that, that I haven't seen? And if no, not- there aren't, there aren't any questions at this point. Okay, well, it's two or three minutes before the end. I will turn it back over to my colleagues to uh, close out this webinar. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Bill, for leading today's session, and thank all of you for attending. Um, please remember to complete the session evaluation that will be sent to you by email. And in the coming days, you will also receive a professional development hour certificate for your participation in the webinar. Thank you again, and this concludes today's training.